Welcome back. Today, as per one of your requests, we are looking at how to quieten your mind and achieve a sense of internal calm without feeling guilty. Now, this is something that I personally struggle with and have, to be honest, always struggled with. I'm someone who loves to be busy, I'm someone who loves to make progress, and now being self-employed, well, the need to carry on working and the guilt around relaxing is just higher than ever. And I don't think it's just me. A lot of you have got in contact with me saying that you struggle with quieting your mind, stopping the negative thoughts, but not just negative thoughts, stopping any thoughts. And whilst it's scientifically not possible to stop all of your thoughts, and realistically, you probably wouldn't want to do that. There are tools and strategies we can use that are backed by neuroscience to help us create the sense of peace that we need inside our mind so that when we go back to our work, go back to our kids, go back to whatever takes up most of our energy, we have a new sense of calm and perspective with which to show up as our best in that scenario. So in this video, I'm going to talk through five key ways in which you can achieve this sense of calm and what the science says about the reason why they actually work. So let's go with number one. We all want to feel productive and as though we've achieved something and made progress and some of us need that more than others and although that helps us to propel forwards in our career and to be active and really make the most out of life, sometimes it can actually go in the other direction. You see, Having this intense desire to make progress makes it sometimes very tricky to actually relax. So my strategy for coping with both the desire to be productive and also the need to relax and quieten your mind is by combining the both of them. And I do this through what I like to call progress projects. A progress project is anything that allows you to feel a sense of progress, but is in something that either consumes all of your attention or requires very little attention and therefore allows you to relax whilst you do it. So some examples of this could be coloring or doing a jigsaw or maybe even reading a book or working out. So with all of those examples, the act of reading, coloring, doing a jigsaw, or working out, for instance, are all things that require a lot of your attention, but yet they don't require a lot of brain power. And the more you do it, the more progress you make, the more pages you get through, the more pieces of the jigsaw you fill in, and ultimately with coloring, the more you color, the more beautiful and bright the picture is. And of course, with working out, over time you see the progress in your body. None of these require a lot of mental energy, but they do allow you to relax. They do consume your focus to the point where it's very difficult to have whirlwinds of thoughts going on in your mind because to some degree you're not only concentrating, but you're also concentrating on something that's quite calming, quite methodical and quite therapeutic. Hey, why not even try knitting? As for the science of using a progress project or hobby as a way to relax, then it backs it up very nicely. Whether it's playing music, creating art, cooking food, or any of the other things that I suggested before, actually activates the brain's reward system. Now the brain's reward system is what is used to regulate mood and increase motivation and determine the emotion that you feel. So when you engage in an activity that you find enjoyable or rewarding, for instance, those little moments of progress as you colour in a leaf or put in a piece of a puzzle. Your brain actually releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter associated with feelings of pleasure and reward. This in turn creates a sense of enjoyment and relaxation, which can in turn help to quiet the mind and reduce stress. Secondly, activities such as this can provide a focus and absorption that can help quiet the mind by directing attention away from the things that you usually would stress about or worry about. When we do these activities, we activate the brain's prefrontal cortex, which is really quite incredible because when the prefrontal cortex is activated, it can help to shift attention away from the negative thoughts that usually consume us, those distractions that usually consume all of our attention. And in fact, it actually promotes the state of flow and the idea of being in the zone, which if you don't necessarily get that in your everyday, and if you find that you struggle to get in the zone through your work or other areas of your life, then again, having one of these things, one of these activities, one of these hobbies, in your daily life 
can really help you to feel that calm, that satisfaction that you're not getting. And that really helps to calm your mind. Finally, not only can these activities promote relaxation, but they also reduce physiological arousal. Basically the internal aliveness we get from being around different environments or with having lots of things going on, whether on our phone or in our immediate external environment. And so when we take time to do these things, our parasympathetic nervous system is also activated because we're not being distracted by so many things around us. We're just focusing on one thing and in turn can have incredible effects, such as a decreased heart rate and even decreased blood pressure. So get out your coloring pens, get out your Christmas puzzle. It doesn't matter that it's not Christmas. I won't judge you. Or find a new recipe to cook and really immerse yourself in the experience of doing this one activity and enjoy the progress, desire the progress, but also be present, present with each puzzle piece, present with each drawer of the pen, and you'll therefore end the activity not feeling guilty because you've actually made progress, you've satisfied this desire within you, but you've also at the same time calmed yourself down, which allows you to accept that progress just that little bit more. Strategy number two to quieten your mind is to make the most of nature. Now, I know that that sounds really basic, really obvious, but I actually recently came across a research report around the cognitive benefits of interacting with nature. And I tell you, it taught me stuff that I didn't know before and has definitely made me go out into nature more, having read it. The paper says, imagine a therapy that had no known side effects, was readily available and could improve your cognitive functioning at zero cost. Such a therapy has been known to philosophers, writers and lay people alike, interacting with nature. That paragraph really grabbed me because it's so true. We know that there are so many benefits from getting out into nature and yet even though it's free, even though it's always available, and even though everybody goes on about it, we still don't do it nearly enough. And I guess it's just like drinking more water. The things that don't cost that much and are super readily available are less sexy, they're less enticing, and they're easy to ignore. But after you've heard some of this science around why interacting with nature rather than your phone or even your home environment is so powerful, I think it might change your opinion around nature and in turn obviously help you to quieten your mind. According to ART, interacting with environments rich with inherently fascinating stimuli, g sunsets, invoke involuntary attention modestly, allowing directed attention mechanisms a chance to replenish. So the logic is that after an interaction with natural environments, one is able to perform better on tasks that depend on directed attention abilities. Unlike natural environments, urban environments contain bottom-up stimulation, for instance car horns, that captures attention dramatically and additionally requires directed attention to overcome that stimulation, for instance avoiding traffic, ignoring advertising and so forth. So what the research is telling us is that nature is so rich with stimuli, it can fire up our headspace and get us excited. Very similar to how we are stimulated through our phones, through social media, through gossip. Except, as the paper said, things like sunsets and rustling trees and sunlight twinkling through branches attracts attention involuntarily, so it's not trying to force itself down our throats, it's just there for us to take notice of. And secondly, it does so modestly. It doesn't try to zap our brains so that we have no ability to look anywhere else. Instead, we're voluntarily watching the sunrise. We're voluntarily taking note of the breeze rustling through our hair. However, with urban environments, or even just these days, being in our own home where there's so much electronics, so much noise, so much trying to grab our attention within what used to be a safe, calming place, kind of no longer is. Our homes have become a mecca for stimulation, which means that we're constantly engaged, constantly feeling like we can do pretty much anything, but yet feeling drained and overwhelmed and tired by the amount of stuff we have at our fingertips. And that's because there's overstimulation. These things are trying to capture our attention, basically rendering us powerless. And so we get captured and it's not voluntary. 
And this attention capturing is dramatic. It's not subtle. It's not modest in the way that nature is. So do you see how if you allow nature to excite you, it will. And you can get just as much excitement and enjoyment from being outside and interacting with the elements around us. Just as you can from a screen or a film. But one has a lot healthier lasting impacts. For instance, increased attention and memory. Whereas the other is only making our attention shorter. So how does this help you quieten your mind? Well, usually we, we turn to films, we turn to music, we turn to all this modern day noise to try and block out the thoughts that are stressing us out to try and forget the negative thoughts, to try and make it feel like none of our thoughts are our own. And if we do have any thoughts, it's for the heroine of the movie, it's for the victim of the movie, it's for the people that we see on social media. But actually they just create more thoughts afterwards and don't help us feel at peace within ourselves. So all of this research that we just talked about around nature means that we get this same energy, same aliveness through nature, but we're almost being stopped in our tracks and feeling really grounded within our environment. So we're almost humbled to the point where these little niggly thoughts no longer really matter. We're in a space, if we put our phone away and turn our attention to what's around us and really focus on what we can see, hear, smell, taste and touch, then we become consumed by our environment in a healthy way rather than consumed by our thoughts. And again, this is something that you should never feel guilty about because if you have kids and you feel guilty about not being with your kids, then the best thing you can do for them is bring them along with you. Yes, they add to the noise, but also teaching them to appreciate this nature as a way to quiet their mind might be one of the best lessons you ever teach them. But also remembering that if you feel bad because you feel like you should be working, just remember that you probably check your phone an hour throughout your workday, checking social media, picking up a phone call, messaging somebody. And so to swap that hour or swap that half an hour and instead go out into nature, when you come back, your attention span will be much better than if you'd spent that half an hour on your phone. What is your internal calm place? Where is it that you find yourself wanting to run off to when things get a little bit stressful? Are you someone who loves being by the beach and actually being in a hammock by the beach is the most relaxing place that you can think of? Maybe it's simply being sat next to a family member or your partner in utter silence, but just having their arm around you. Maybe it's in your own home. Maybe there's a sofa or a seat or a view in your home that really makes you feel at ease and makes you feel at peace. Maybe it's somewhere that you've never been before but you imagine it in your mind. Maybe like me it's walking through a forest, feeling the soil underneath your feet, feeling totally safe, surrounded by these trees and this cool breeze but not too cold seeing the sunlight poking through the branches above you. That's where I feel the most calm, no matter whether I'm actually there or whether I'm actually just at home imagining being there. You see, I used to think that I needed to buy a piece of land. Honestly, every time I'd get stressed, I would go on to, I think there's a website called Woods For You or something like that, and I would try and find a piece of land nearby that I could afford. But realistically, that, that was never going to be a practical way to decrease the stress and increase the quiet in my mind and in my life. So I found that actually one of the most incredible things that you can do that again requires no cost and is readily available to everybody is to go to that place in your mind. You see, research suggests that when we engage in something like visualisation, it actually activates similar neuro pathways in the brain as those involved in actually experiencing that thing itself. So the senses that come alive when we're actually in a wood, when we're actually by the beach, when we're swimming in a pool, when we're by our partner, are the same 
things that are activated just by imagining them. And I think that just goes to show how powerful the brain is. So go right now to that place, close your eyes, or you can even do this with your eyes open. And if you struggle to do that, it will get easier with time. But go to that place now. Imagine this scene. Right now, you are activating the same brain regions that are involved in processing the visual and auditory information when you're actually there. And this activation of these neural pathways can create a sense of relaxation and calmness in your body, which in turn reduces the stress and anxiety. Also activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for your body's rest and digest response, characterized by a decrease in heart rate, blood pressure, and muscle tension. And this physiological response can actually help to counteract the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for your body's fight or flight response to stress and anxiety. So through visualizing, through putting yourself in that peaceful environment just within your own head, you're quietening your fight and flight response that usually fires up during stressful environments. And so your sympathetic nervous system is quietened. You don't want to quiet the parts of your mind that are happy, that are excited, that are grateful. When you say you want to quiet your mind, you're wanting to get rid of the unhealthy noise, the noise that makes you feel worried, the noise that overwhelms you. And that is all to do with the sympathetic nervous system. However, what we want more of is this parasympathetic nervous system which helps us relax and rest and digest. So rather than fighting or running away from your problems, you get into a state where you're actually allowing your body to rest, which is exactly what meditation is for. But for those of you like myself who don't really get on with a typical form of meditation, this is something that can be just as powerful. Finally, visualization can obviously be used to promote positive emotion and reframe your negative thoughts. So yes, you can visualize a calm, peaceful environment in your mind, but if you are someone who has a lot of anxiety or really gets impacted by stress, then in those stressful situations, visualizing the situation going well or you handling it well can actually increase your confidence and decrease your anxiety in those real life situations. So there's a whole load of science behind how visualizing or just going to a place in your mind that makes you feel the way you want to feel, that helps to quiet your mind. Think about the place that stopped you thinking, the place that made you so totally present you couldn't help but be there and ignore the nagging thoughts. And actually afterwards, you had a bit more perspective on those thoughts and they got you down a little bit less. Remember, this is all in your own mind, so this is always available to you. And it doesn't even require good weather like, like nature sometimes does. Strategy number four, non-judgment. You see, we, again, most of the time, the reason why we want to quieten our thoughts and have a mind that is just serene is because the thoughts in our mind don't please us. We don't like them. We are not thinking thoughts that make us feel good. And so practicing non-judgment, or if you're an OG follower, then you'll know that I like to refer to it as neutrality. Not even trying to make the situation a positive, just leaving it neutral can have amazing effects for quietening our mind. And of course, if anything, it helps us even more to not feel guilty because, well, we're not judging ourselves or our thoughts. And so there's no space for guilt. Now, again, I'm gonna go over some of the science as to why and how non-judgment can help us and what the impact is on our brain and our stress levels, both in the short term and the long term. So practicing non-judgment, or some people would call it mindfulness, but we're gonna go with non-judgment here, has been found to have a significant impact on the brain's neural activity, which actually ends up changing the way that we process and respond to things. So we become less reactive and more responsive. So something that I learned whilst researching for this video was that in our brains, we have something called the DMN, the default mode network. Now, basically this is a fancy way of saying autopilot, but DMN or autopilot isn't just something that we've created. It's actually a network of brain regions that we have up here, which is pretty darn cool. So what happens is that this 
network of brain regions is activated when our minds aren't focused on the outside world, such as when we're daydreaming or ruminating which is, again, a fancy word for overthinking. Studies have shown that the DMN is associated with self-referential thinking and a sense of personal identity. When we bring non-judgment into the mix, it can help to disrupt this network by reducing the self-referential thinking that often leads to negative thought patterns. Being non-judgmental also increases activity in the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that is involved in cognitive function, decision-making, and your memory. But it's also involved in regulating emotional responses, such as fear and anxiety. So when you meditate or simply choose to take a neutral approach to the thoughts that come into your mind, you in turn learn to regulate your emotional responses to negative thoughts. So this is, I guess, both a short-term and definitely, definitely a long-term solution because over time when you practice not jumping to conclusions, not getting swept up when something doesn't go the way you planned, not having really high expectations that are just bound to go wrong, you learn to be in control of your emotions and you choose how you want to feel rather than letting your emotions sweep you up as a result of your default mode network. And there is so much more science, so I'll just run through the remaining science and then we'll hop on to the final strategy. So being non-judgmental also promotes activity in the insula. Now the insula might be a new word to you, but it's essentially the part of the brain that is involved in emotional awareness and bodily sensations. Ooh. Basically what this means is that when activity happens in the insula, then it means that we're aware of our not only our emotional state, but also what our body feels like. So if you find that you constantly have loads of issues with your body or you never know what to eat, or you regularly find yourself bursting into tears, or now obviously if you're on medication, that's completely different and these strategies will probably require a different approach for you. Practicing meditation or this non-judgmental, neutral focus can help you to become more aware of what's going on inside you, emotionally and physically, which is a superpower if you ask me. And finally, practicing non-judgment and neutrality increases the activity in the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, these are just fancy words that you do not need to remember, but it just legitimizes what I'm saying. I'm not making this up. So what the anterior cingulate cortex does is it's a part of the brain that helps us with our attentional control and cognitive processing. So basically it helps us to understand things quicker, helps us to pay attention, remain focused and reduce the impact of distracting thoughts. So that was a ton of information I just threw at you, but all you need to know is that practicing a non-judgmental mindset is again, a habit that you'll develop over time if you really listen to this and have heard all that science and thought, you know what? This is something that I won't feel guilty about. If anything, it'll help you be be a better parent. In fact, it will definitely help you be a better parent. And it will also help you to feel better in yourself, as well as obviously the, the natural consequence of quieting your mind as and when you want a quiet mind. Because both in the practice of this, but also in the impact of this, your thoughts become under control and less distracting. Strategy number five is to press pause. Now, this is something that I recently shared in my first Wednesday Wisdom email. Now, this is just a email I send around every single Wednesday with a read time of between 60 seconds to two minutes. So it's really not that long. It's just a nugget of a strategy or a piece of wisdom that I think could really help you if you were to practice it or even would just help you to feel better by the time you've finished reading the email. So if you want to get, jump on to next week's email, then I will leave a link in the description box below. Every few weeks I will be doing a giveaway. So if you want to win one of my journals, if you want to win one of my challenges pad or a discount or a bunch of other things that will be coming soon, then I'm telling you, jump on that list. So what do I mean by press pause? Well, this is something that I've been trying to do lately because I've realized that I'm rarely aware of my surroundings. You see, the more time you spend in one environment and with the same people, the more your brain gets used to it and you're not really learning anything new within that environment, if that makes sense. You are so used to what's around you and where everything is, subconsciously how many steps you have to take to get to the sink, the particular angle your body has to turn as you go up the stairs, 
Your brain has it all worked out. It's running on autopilot, aka that default mode network. And so if you spend a lot of time in one place or a couple of places, you'll find that you're very rarely present and it's quite a scary thought if I'm honest. So what I've been doing lately with my partner who also works at home with me is one of us will suddenly call a pause. Now what a pause is, is pretty much just around 60 seconds where we stop what we're doing, we sit up and we just look around We see what we can smell, see what we can hear, see what we can see, really focus on what's in front of us. So even if you're facing a brick wall like I am right now, you're looking at your desk, you're looking at the colours, you're looking at the little intricate marks on the wall and just focusing on them. Maybe you reach out and you touch them. You become so conscious and aware of what's going on in this present moment. And when you just do that a couple of times a day or even just once a day or one, or a couple of times every few days, you'll find that you're more conscious, more aware and more present and savouring moments much more on a regular basis. So again, guess what? There is some science to back this up. So your last piece of educational material for today is this. We see enhanced activity in the insula, so we become more aware of our emotions and our bodily sensations. Again, a classic impact of meditation, but this is just a shortened version of meditation where you're not having to focus on one specific thing, you're not having to close your eyes, you're just becoming aware, you're becoming super present. What's quite cool is our brain regions also see enhanced connectivity between them, which allows us to have more cognitive control and emotional regulation. So in 2015, a study published in Biological Psychiatry found that those who had mindful pauses saw an increased connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the insula, which can facilitate more effective regulation of emotional responses to stress. And there's a ton more science behind it, but really the science focuses more on meditation as a whole, rather than these small little pauses that I'm suggesting that you can do no matter where you are. And maybe if you are a well-being lead in a school or in a company, then suggesting that your team have these pauses, that some of you just call a pause at particular moments in the day, could have a real impact on your teams or your classes or your family's focus, tension, memory, and overall well-being. So there you have it, five simple scientifically backed strategies to help you quieten your mind, have some much needed respite from all the noise that goes on in both home and work life, or simply to shush the negative voice that just feels like it wants to make your life miserable but ultimately you're in control. And that control starts here by taking action on even just one of the strategies I've just suggested. And if you don't know how to do that, then head back to last week's video where I gave you five simple ways to make your life easier. Five insanely simple ways to make your life easier. And one of those was how to actually implement stuff like this. So you're not just hearing it and then not doing anything with it so that is it from me i look forward to seeing you next week i hope to see you next week if you like this please do give this video a subscribe a like and a comment i want to know what you think which strategy you're going to use first of all or even any that you already do and hey maybe come back in a few weeks time and tell me whether your mind is any quieter but this self-improvement work is always a journey. It never comes to an end. You will always have noise in your mind, like I said at the beginning. These strategies are to help us choose what noise we want and to not get affected by that noise as much unless we choose to be affected by it. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share with a friend and I'll see you next week. I appreciate you.